pull out my book and key it out. And it took me about half an hour to identify each one. Uh -huh. um, and so I just kept at it. And now it's like, it takes me about a third of a second to identify each one. Wow. I actually first heard of you from one of my um, interview guests, um, Desert Alchemist, if you know, obviously, who that is. Um, and he was like, I have an awesome guest for you. You should um, contact him. So we've been doing some back and forth, and I'm so happy you are on and here to talk about some fungi. So give the listeners a little bit of who you are and how you got into flora and fungi. Thanks for having me on. My name is Alan Rockefeller, and I have been studying mushrooms for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I got into mushrooms when I was when I moved to California in 1999. I just started hiking, and there was mushrooms everywhere. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, there's got to be people out there who know what these things are. Okay. Uh, but that was before the internet really took off, so they were kind of hard to find. Um, so I joined the local mycological clubs and just started taking pictures of them. And the more I looked at them, the more I thought they were really interesting. Mm. What are you kind of working on now? And how did you get from just kind of like a hobby to like a real passion and doing this full time? So I, um, right now, I'm mostly interested in mushroom identification, taxonomy, mm -hmm. photography, and then the DNA sequencing and microscopy that follows from that. Yeah. And I started... Um, you know, just being liking being outside a lot, hanging, you know, just hanging out outside. And I used to hang out outside a lot, but I didn't really feel like I was making very good use of my time. Like I go hiking and I'm kind of like, well, this is pretty, but what am I doing out here? And then when I started looking at mushrooms, it, you know, it gave me like a goal, something to do when I was outside, a mm -hmm. reason to be out there. And so it kind of made me, you know, made it feel a lot more fulfilling. And I didn't feel like I was wasting my time when I should have been doing something productive by being outside all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and around, oh, it was around 2010, I decided that uh, mushrooms were more interesting than anything else. And so I quit my job and just wanted to see if I could be a mycologist full time. Okay. Um, and my strategy was a little bit unconventional. I decided that I would try to be as helpful as possible on the internet. So um, that's mostly identifying mushrooms for other people. And so um, that actually worked out pretty well. And now when, when people need a mycologist, often they'll come to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what were you doing before being a mycologist? You said you quit your job. So what were you doing prior um, I was working at NASA breaking into computers. <laughs> wow, that's a switch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was at NASA for 10 years and I had been breaking into computers for about 20 years. Wow. Um, so I started breaking into computers when I was in high school doing a lot of illegal hacking, um, but never got caught. And then once I graduated high school, I started getting jobs in the computer security field. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, that, that was pretty fun. Um, I like doing jobs where it would all be felonies if I wasn't paid to do it. Um, so computer security um, kind of fit the bill pretty well. So, wow. you know, that was a lot of breaking into computers. And then once I broke in, I would call the people that run the computer and let them know how I broke in and how to fix it. Okay. Um, and also lots of forensics, like when they did get broken into, I would figure mm -hmm. out how that happened and how to make it so it doesn't happen again. Wow. And you know, the intrusion detection and uh, packet sniffers and just, you know, all, all that sort of stuff that goes with uh, breaking into computers. And yeah. that was pretty fun, but a little bit unfulfilling. Mm. Um, you know, it paid really well, but at the same time, it was kind of like, why do I really care if these computers get broken into? Yeah. And, um, you know, when you're like 16 and you're breaking into army bases, you're like, wow, this is the <laughs> coolest thing ever. I can't believe that I can do this. Wow. Um, but, you know, like, the army base computers are actually extremely boring and they were just like ordering provisions and stuff like that. And mm. so, um, yeah, I, I have no, no interest in breaking into computers these days. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, that's very extreme. Like both like mycology and, um, forensics and all of that. I feel like it takes a lot of, you know, thinking and, um, education are those two different things. So that's wild that you're 
pa- like you were passionate about both of them or you were really good at both of them. So, well, they're kind of polar opposites. Yeah. Um, and that's really good. And for a couple of reasons, one, it just gives my balance some balance to my life. So I spend a lot of time in the computer, but then also lots of time outside. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is that they mix really well. So I really like mixing technology and mycology. And I do that mostly through high-end photography and okay. the DNA barcoding. Right. Um, and do you use PCR? Or is it mostly like microscopy or is that all kind of interweaving together? Well, I got my first microscope in 2007 because I wanted to discover new species. Mm -hmm. And I thought it didn't actually work very well for that. Every time I tried to figure out if something is a new species, it would be, it might, you know, the results would come back from the microscope and it'd kind of be like, oh, no, this is just what I thought it was. And I was actually wrong most of the time. Oh. So in 2010, I got started with PCR. Okay. And now I do a lot of PCR. I have a little lab in my garage um, Mm. that I run PCR in. And um, that is so much more accurate and works so much better for what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So now my process is to go out into the woods and find some cool mushroom and take the best pictures I possibly can of it. And then I collect everything I photograph and bring that back home, dry it and run PCR. And then when I get the results, I blast those. And often that answers my question right there. Uh, But sometimes it doesn't. And so if the DNA sequence doesn't answer my question, then I will use the microscope. And the reason I do it that way is because microscopy to do a good job is extremely time consuming. Um, Like I can spend all day on one collection. And you know, when I do that, it's a really good day because microscopy is super relaxing and the mushrooms are just as beautiful microscopically <laughs> than they are macroscopically. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, that's a lot of time to spend on one collection. So the DNA barcoding, um, you know, just takes a few minutes to do um, when I'm running a lot of them. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, really it helps a lot to mix the two. Okay. So by getting uh, the really good photos plus the microscopy plus the DNA barcode, then wow. I can really get some insight into what this organism is. Okay. And can you explain to the listeners what PCR is and why that's important for um, IDing or things like that? PCR is polymerase chain reaction. And so this is a chemical reaction that copies DNA. So mushrooms have about 40 million base pairs of DNA in the genome. So that's like a book that's 40 million letters long. And the genes that I'm interested in using for identification are usually about 600 base pairs long or 600 characters. So by using PCR, I can just get that 600 characters out of the 40 million. Mm -hmm. So really all a PCR machine is, is a thermocycler. So it just heats up and cools down liquid. And so you can get one of these things on eBay for about 300 bucks and they have 96 little wells in them. And so you can have like 96 mushrooms or you can do plants or bacteria, Mm -hmm. any living thing with DNA, it doesn't matter. Um, But I just do a quick DNA extraction, throw it into the PCR machine and let it run for a couple hours and um, then sequence it. And I get um, this unique DNA barcode and um, it works amazingly well in that each species has a unique barcode and similar species will have similar barcodes. So, um, so I just paste that into blast and I can see right away where else in the world this exact species was found if it ever has been found in sequence before sequence Mm -hmm. before and also all the closely related species and i can download the sequences from the closely related sequences and build a little phylogenetic tree so i can see where my mushroom fits into the whole tree of life Uh, but usually the question i'm trying to answer with dna barcoding is what did i find so usually i get that right on right from the ncbi blast okay wow yeah, that's amazing. And can you do this out in the field as well? Or do you have to bring everything back to your garage? I can, but it's a lot better to bring it back. Okay. Um, so in my car, I have a 2000 watt inverter, so I can run the PCR machine in my car. Uh, but I don't very often for a couple of reasons. One reason is I'm collecting all the mushrooms anyway. So mm-hmm. it's as long as yeah. I'm collecting them, I might as well make good use of the daylight time, be out there photographing them, and then just kind of work on them in the evenings in my garage. Um, the other thing is the PCR machine takes a lot of electricity, so it has to be 
the car has to be running while, when it's doing that. So if I'm driving a long distance, you know, I can set up a PCR and then just throw it in the, tr the trunk mm -hmm. and drive a couple hours and not have to idle the car for a couple hours. But otherwise, I'm just idling the car for a couple hours at the campsite, which seems kind of lame. Um, <laughs> so typically what I will do is get the best picture I can and then throw the mushrooms in a tackle box. And so, you know, most of the mushrooms I collect are pretty small, so mm -hmm. they all fit you know, pretty well into a tackle box because cool. uh, smallest mushrooms are the coolest, but you know, occasionally those big mushrooms do, and I'll throw them in Tupperwares. Okay. Uh, but then what I do at the end of the day is I have these little paper bags. So like the, um, can't even get them in the United States, but they're super common in Mexico. They sell snacks, uh, sell snacks in them. Okay. And so I go to Mexico and get these little paper bags and I take each collection out of the tackle box at the end of the day throw it into the paper bag and then I write on the bag mm. um, I'll either write the iNaturalist number or if they haven't been uploaded to iNaturalist yet I will write the date and the species uh, maybe a little collection number and then I throw those up on my dashboard and just drive around for a few days and after a couple of days um, mm -hmm. I'll take the bag down if it's completely cracked or dry then I'll put it into a container with desiccant and then I have these dried collections wow. and you know those stay good you know if you keep them dry pretty much indefinitely okay um, so then you know I kind of have like a library at home that has everything that I found so if I want to study something I can just pull it out of the library and uh, wow. just go ahead and study it Wow, that's really cool. I I was actually posting on iNaturalist a few months ago, and you were actually the one to um, ID it correctly. So thank you for that. So that was really cool to see. <laughs> it was a uh, that must have been um, must have been a mushroom, and um, it must have been when I was in Florida. Mm -hmm. So usually, um, you know, I, what I'll do is I will identify all of the mushrooms that are posted to iNaturalist in whatever state that I'm in. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm doing all of Michigan. Um, a couple months ago, I was visiting Florida, so I was mm -hmm. doing everything in Florida. Mm -hmm. And that does a couple things. Um, one thing that's really nice is it lets me know what's coming up around there. Mm -hmm. So I can see like how the season is and, in mm -hmm. various parts of the state. And um, if I see something really cool, I'll just go to those exact coordinates on iNaturalist and uh, you know just take a picture of it. And when I upload stuff to iNaturalist, I never obscure the coordinates. I figure mm -hmm. if I'm going to put the work into finding a spot, I want everybody else to be able to know exactly where it is too. Or if somebody, you know, sees something I post, I want them to be able to go there and get a sample of it or whatever. Um, so I think it's really nice when people don't obscure coordinates unless it's yeah. something that's like really, um, you know, those few people would like destroy. But that's more of a problem with plants than mushrooms. Yeah. Um, okay. just, you know, people doesn't really matter if people pick the mushrooms, they just come back the next time it rains. Right. Um, but the other thing that it does, um, just helping people out and I naturalist in that way is just, uh, you know, makes me feel like I'm doing something good for the world and just like, you know, helping people out. And mm -hmm. the more I identify stuff in iNaturalist, the more people will be encouraged to post there mm -hmm. and it builds the database up and makes it a more useful tool for everybody. Yeah. No, it was it was really fun because we were we've been talking for a while and then I was like, Oh nice, he even ID'd my uh my mushroom for me. So that was that was yeah, really cool. And I usually identify a few hundred every day in iNaturalist. <laughs> um but I can't get to all of them. But if people just message me their username, I can just real quick flip through their account and um, okay. put names on what I can. Okay. And you're you're uh, you were also saying that there's a code or a number on iNaturalist. So um when you relook something up there's that like id of it yeah exactly so whenever you create an observation on iNaturalist it assigns it a unique nine digit oh. number and that's just the observation number uh -huh. so you can like see that in your iNaturalist app though it's a little easier from the website like whenever you click on an iNaturalist observation just mm -hmm. that number at the end of the url is the observation number oh, okay and so you can you can just take that number and paste it into your web browser and pull up the observation. Mm -hmm. So I label all of my collections um, with that number. And that way, when I have dried mushrooms, I can always know exactly which mushrooms they are. And I don't have to wonder like which photo goes with mm. which mushroom. And after a few weeks, it you know becomes you know really, really hard to figure out which mushroom what it was without that. Um, I also get a lot of mushrooms in the mail and I require everybody to make an iNaturalist observation and label it on there. Cause otherwise wow. if, if I get mushrooms in the mail and there's no iNaturalist number on there, it's so hard to figure out yeah. what it is. And if I guess and I get it wrong, then it's like even worse than not studying it at all. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I keep track of everything through, through doing that. 
Okay. And do you donate any of your specimens or do you just have your own collection or how does that kind of work? I have my own collection. Cool. Um, I don't usually give them to herbariums and there's a few reasons for that. Um, probably the most important reason is that once you give it, put it in the herbarium, then it's really hard for people to get access to it and study it. Oh. So the um, like the academics can do it, but if mm. just like a regular person wants to study some mushroom, I found you know, if I'm like, sorry, I give it to the herbarium, they could contact the herbarium, and the herbarium would probably be like, well, let's see your institutional affiliation, and we'll send oh. it or something like that. So it basically makes it useless once it goes into their barium for anybody that's not hmm. associated with like some kind of academic institution. Yeah, man, that's unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah, and every herbarium is different and everyone's relationship with their herbarium managers is, mm -hmm. is different. So, you know, if you know somebody in an herbarium, you can usually study them. Uh, okay. I study a lot of stuff in herbariums, um, but, you know, it's, it's like... Um, you know, a lot of times they won't just let anybody study mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, okay. Whereas, like, if anybody contacts me and is like, hey, can you send me a sample of that thing you found four years ago? Um, I'd be like, yeah, sure, and just pop some in the mail. True. Wow. That's cool that you get some um, mushroom samples in the mail. Yeah, I get a <laughs> lot of mushrooms in the mail. Um, and so usually people send it to me for DNA barcoding. Uh -huh. um, it'll, it'll usually be because I'll notice that on like Instagram or iNaturalist or Mushroom yeah. Observer or something, I'll be like, wow, that's probably, you know, a new species. Um, and, you know, ask people to send me a little bit of it. Okay. And very often it is. So I'll just sequence it in my garage and add the DNA barcode to GenBank and then add the DNA barcode to the iNaturalist observation so that data is out there forever. Wow. Wow, that's really neat. How many uh mushrooms or fungi do you try to id or work on in a day <laughs> oh it really depends uh what i'm doing mm -hmm. but if i'm just like hanging out at, at home um, i'll probably identify about 300 mushrooms a day and that takes me like maybe an hour whoa wow that is a fast process i didn't even know how fast of a thing you just you got down to a t or well, the iNaturalist identify interface is mm. very fast. So um, it doesn't really work on the phone uh, or any kind of mobile device, but on the computer, you just go to slash observation slash identify, or you just okay. throw that word slash identify into any iNaturalist URL and this box comes up and you can really quickly, okay. like, it's like flipping through flashcards. Mm -hmm. And so as fast as you can type, you can identify stuff. Wow. So it typically takes about five minutes for me to do 30. And okay. that's mostly just typing. Um, you know, when I started identifying mushrooms for people, it was like 2007. Mm -hmm. And I would just go on the internet and um, find people that wanted mu mushrooms identified. And then I would pull out my book and key it out. And it took me about half an hour to identify each one. Uh -huh. um, and so I just kept at it. And now it's like, it takes me about a third of a second to identify yeah. each one. Wow. Um, you know, it's really, really just like learning a foreign language. Yeah. Um, I think it takes the same parts of your brain that you use when you're identifying plants mm -hmm. for mushrooms to, mm -hmm. uh, to speak a foreign language. And I think it's the same difficulty too. Like if I was to try to learn Chinese, it would take forever for the first <laughs> few months. And then after a few years, it would just be like super fast. Yeah. Uh, but now just like riding down the car in the free, you know, on the freeway, I look over and I know what all the mushrooms are. Right. And you probably see repeating ones. So you already are like, oh, I already got, I already know that one. Okay. Oh yeah. Every time you see a mushroom, you know, it's kind of like seeing an old friend. <laughs> um, and, you know, in the, in the field guide, they're all like pristine, nice, uh, nice photos. But right. in the real world, you know, most of the mushrooms are, you know, after a while they get rotten and they all rot in different ways. Mm -hmm. So like, seeing them when they're in all different stages of development um, really helps. So you can like know what, you know, what something looks like after it's almost completely decayed. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's I didn't even think about it like that. They all look different, you know, emerging and decomposing. Mm hmm. And what are some of like the key applications you would use um, sequencing or PCR? That's a really good question. And when somebody tells me they want to sequence something, my first question to them is always, well, what is the question that you're trying to answer? Mm -hmm. So DNA sequencing can answer a lot of different types of questions. Um, me personally, my question is always the same. And that is, what did I find? Is it a new species? Mm -hmm. Where else in the world is it? 
uh, does it turn up? And so, you know, DNA barcoding the ITS gene of a fungus is the easiest way to answer those three questions. Okay. But there's a lot of other questions that people can ans- answer too. Um, a lot of people like and it's asking the question like what is where where does this come in on the phylogenetic tree what's it related to and so the ITS gene can give you like some insight into that but usually mm-hmm. more conserved genes are used for that because ITS is so variable that you cannot uh, um, align it very well cannot compare it well with other organisms unless they're very closely related so usually they'll sequence ITS and then some more conserved genes like LSU TEF1 um, and then you can build like a multi-gene phylogenetic tree. Sometimes people have questions like, what strain did I find? Um, like you see with all these cubensis cultivators, they have infinite number of strains. And if you sequence, uh, if you use DNA barcode, the ITS gene, doesn't matter what strain you put in, it'll come out with the same thing, mm. you know, the same result. So you need to use full genome sequencing for that. So that's okay. just reading the whole genome instead of about 600 characters. Um, And there's a lot of other questions that need to be need full genome sequencing to answer as well. Um, Questions like, where is this native to? Is it native or introduced here? Mm -hmm. Or questions like, how does this mushroom make this chemical? Um, Or why is it red or anything like that? You can really dig into the genome and and figure it out with full genome sequencing. Oh, that's Um, cool. It only cost me about five bucks to sequence a mushroom and that's to get a forward and reverse read. Okay. Um, you know, with Sanger sequencing and with new technologies like Nanopore, um, the cost is even much lower, like uh, significantly under a dollar. Mm. But a full genome can cost anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars. Whoa. And then you get all this data that needs to be analyzed. So uh, very different kinds of sequencing are available depending on what your question is. Yeah. And why would... Um, I guess identifying new species be important to anything? That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, you know, in mushrooms, a lot of the mushrooms are undiscovered. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I can go out hiking and easily discover 50 new species in an afternoon. Um, and that's like really anywhere in the world you go, like a lot of the stuff you see is going to be new. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's no financial incentive for anybody to discover new species. So the only people who are publishing new species of mushrooms are people that really care about them. Um, it's either like amateurs that are just really into them, or Mm -hmm. it'll be people that work at universities and kind of like have a researcher position or maybe university students that are like doing the PhD or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's no one paying anybody to go out there and discover new mushrooms. So some of the most common mushrooms that you see, just like the most common mushroom in California is probably Lactarius alnicola or Styrium herzutum. And both of those are just names that we borrowed from other places because the California version doesn't have a name yet. Oh. Uh, but probably the best reason to describe new species is so you can communicate about what you have. Um, so, you know, there's, so we have a word that we can use to tell people like, oh, I found this, or, you know, I found this really interesting chemical, maybe it's medicinal, maybe it's just really cool, but mm-hmm. some chemical in a mushroom, and then you can communicate which fungus had that chemical. Oh, okay. Um, also you kind of need to have names for stuff in order to preserve it. So okay. you can't really be like, oh, you shouldn't chop down this forest because there's this unnamed mushroom there. <laughs> uh, it sounds much better to say, oh, you shouldn't chop down this forest because this mushroom is only known from this forest and nowhere else in the world. Right. Right. Huh. And I've noticed that you've been on tons of adventures around the world. So <laughs> T- tell me um, what current projects or past or future projects that you're kind of signed up with. Well, most recently, I went um, to New Zealand for mm-hmm. two weeks with Joey Santoro. We made a bunch of new crime pace but botany doesn't videos, mm-hmm. uh, which all came out in the past few days. So that was really fun. Um, pretty much just went around, looked at mushrooms for two weeks. And also I looked at plants. And so I've learned a lot about plants from yes. Joey. Um, but yeah, that was really cool because it's so far away and so isolated from everything else. So pretty much every plant and every mushroom I saw was something mm-hmm. I had never seen before. And so now I have many thousands of photos from there that I'm processing. Um, generally I'll process like a couple hundred photos a day. So probably in 10 or 20 years, I'll have all of those d- done and online. Uh, but then I was also in Ecuador for a month. Yeah. 
and um, Ecuador had really cool stuff. Um, you know, the mushrooms were super interesting. The people were really nice. And um, we were able to work with some researchers who were um, already studying stuff in Ecuador. And mm-hmm. they did some nanopore sequencing on some of the mushrooms we found. So I got a bunch of sequence data back recently. So I'm processing that, figuring out what exactly it is that we found in Ecuador. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also working for this um, project called Fundus. And this is a group um, that got a grant to study the mushrooms of California. Um, so it was a grant from the state. It's the first time the state has paid people to go out and collect mushrooms in California. Wow. And so I go out and collect the mushrooms from the, uh, for them, and then they all get dried and saved forever. Um, and, you know, this summer, I just have a lot of travel planned, pretty much one, a different mushroom event every weekend uh, from the end of July um, until, uh, until the end of October. Wow. So at the end of July is the Southwest Fungi, yes. uh, Fungi Festival. We'll be in, there. Um, yeah, that'll be awesome. Um, in New Mexico. And then the weekend after that is Mycofest in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And then the weekend after that is the Telluride Mushroom Festival. I want to be and there too. there's the Nama Foray in North Carolina. Um, and there's the Georgia Mushroom Festival and then the Olympic Peninsula Mushroom Festival. And uh, pretty, uh, pretty much just every weekend. So yeah. it'll be like a big, long road trip all summer and oh i will God. come home with lots of mushrooms uh to barcode wow and yeah I, what's funny is i just released my episode with joey as well so that's just and i love new zealand i've been there too and that's where i got to teach some people about fungi as well and so that was just really cool to find passion in that and also show people what mushrooms are and the importance of that as well um but yeah, no, that was really cool that you got to do all of those adventures. How would you, how do you even get on board with those? Like, how does that even start to do those? Uh, to do what exactly? Like, how, how would you, how does one get onto these um, journeys to go ID mushrooms for people? Um, it, there was a National Geographic photographer that, um, that we were able to convince uh, to come take pictures of us in Ecuador. Okay. And so, um, so I just, um, you know, went down there with my girlfriend and um, we figured as long as we're going to go down there to take pictures, um, then we would also invite the whole internet. And so <laughs> we did. Um, and so we made this web page for it and just kind of like invited everybody to come to Ecuador and we rented out an eco resort. Okay. Um, really nice place called Finca Heimatlos in Pastaza. And uh-huh. um, my friend, who's a really good mushroom identifier, runs that. And so mm. we rented out the whole place and, um, and just did this trip where people came from, from all over and wow. hunted mushrooms down there um, for about a week. And that, that was really cool. It wor- worked out really well. Um, I think I'm going to do the same thing in September in uh, Veracruz, Mexico. Ooh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I was seeing some of the pictures um, that you guys were taking, but also I liked how there was pictures of the people taking pictures because you never really get to see behind the scenes of how um, the lighting is, how crouched down you have to be to these uh, specimens. So, yeah, explain kind of what you have to do to set up a, a photo shoot <laughs> in the jungle. Yeah, yeah. Um- well, if you just kind of like walk up to a mushroom and press the shutter, it, it'll look good about 1% of the time. Wow. Um, but, but really, um, you know, if you can like set everything up to your favor, then you can make like a really stunning picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes may- maybe one or two minutes to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so first is to find a good mushroom. And the good mushroom will be like in good condition, not too like not like all covered in mud or rain down, but like a nice mushroom. And I like to find ones where there's several examples of the same species in different stages of development. Usually they're scattered around. So I'll move them into the frame and, um, you know, a lot of mushrooms look the same from the top. So what I'll do is I will have a few mushrooms that are standing up 
and then set a few mushrooms down in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, at different stages of development. So you see what they look like when they're really small, maybe before the veil breaks, and then how they change as they get bigger and uh, all the way to fully mature. And just kind of set them up in like a way that's like kind of symmetric and pleasing to the eye. Mm -hmm. And then once I have the scene all set up, then I will put the tripod and the camera the tripod is really important for mushroom photography unless you're using a cell phone. And um, then I like to take the pictures. So there are, there's about 90% of the light comes from the sun and then about 10% of the light comes from the LED lights. Okay. And that fills in some of the shadows. If you don't use any extra lighting, then like the gills, which are one of the most important parts, are in a shadow. Mm. So, um, yeah, just add a little bit of extra light. And... Um, my photos didn't really start turning out the way I wanted them to until I started using a technique called photo stacking. Yes. And this works really well for mushrooms. It does not work well for plants outdoors. So you got to bring plants inside if you're going to mm. photo stack them for the most part. Um, not always. There's some ways around it. But, um, you know, I used to shoot everything at like F16, F32, and I never really got enough depth of field. And then everything was just a little bit blurry, but the background wasn't very blurry. There was just like, Never, never was really very happy with how the pictures turned out. Mm -hmm. um, but about three years ago, I started using a technique called photo stacking, where I would just tell the camera to take usually between 30 and 150 pictures. And it okay. would take each picture and then change the focus a little bit. Uh -huh. And then it would open the aperture all the way. So each picture is a very small slice of the entire scene. And I can take as many pictures as I want and then combine them later in post-processing. So that mm -hmm. gives me infinite depth of field. And since the aperture is all the way open, the background gets very blurry very quickly. So you don't have a lot of distracting stuff in the background. Uh, very often, I'll take a picture and then I'll just throw some black felt behind the subject and take another picture. And that okay. gives me a jet black background. Yeah. Um, and that works really well. And then I just go to the computer and load all of the photos um, that I want to combine into software called Helicon. Mm -hmm. And that takes about a minute to com combine them all. Mm -hmm. And then I load it into Photoshop to do the final color correction and save wow. the output. And that way, um, the pictures are extremely sharp. Mm -hmm. There's this, like, you can zoom way in and see all sorts of little details. Um, and then you don't have to worry about getting the depth of field right because you just combine as many pictures as you need and get as much depth of field as you want. Um, so that's the way I take almost all of my pictures mm -hmm. now. And if I'm not going to photo stock it, then I'll just use my cell phone. Mm -hmm. The cell phone works really well for big mushrooms. Okay. Um, so if it was like a Matsutake or, you know, some kind of big bull eat or something, a lot of times you can just barely tell the difference between an expensive professional camera and a cell phone. But for tiny mushrooms, um, you really need a uh, macro lens. Okay. And so the smaller a mushroom is, the more, more important it is to use a professional camera and the more important it is to photo stack it. Mm -hmm. um, also, the tiny mushrooms are really the very awesome ones because big mushrooms, they never really look that good because they've been out there a couple of weeks. They're like bugs and the rain have probably gotten to them. Whereas if the mushroom is only two millimeters tall, it's going to be pristine every mm. single time. Um, also, there's just not that many big mushrooms compared to how many tiny mushrooms there are. That's true. So you get like so much more challenge um, and diversity looking at all the little tiny stuff. And, you know, it's really fun. I can just like go out there with some of my friends that are into macro photography, like Alison Polak, for example. Mm -hmm. We will sit down in front of a rotten log and slowly take it apart. And we'll sit there for four hours and we will photograph maybe 10% of what's in that log. Wow. And it's just so much fun that the time really flies. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's how you find mm -hmm. like the, the really cool rare stuff. It's just by very, you know, slowly you know, going and looking. Yeah. And when it's, when the season's good, I don't have to go very far. Um, like <laughs> when the season's really good, I'm, I'm lucky if I get 50 or a hundred feet into the <laughs> woods or if it hasn't rained in two months, then you know, mm -hmm. I'll easily hike 10 or 15 miles in a day. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really nice because that way when the sun goes down, it's the end of the day. But I only have to walk you know, a couple couple minutes back to my car. Yeah, it all works out. Wow, that's that's a very extensive process. Thank you for explaining. Yeah, it takes a couple minutes, but it's so worth it when yeah. you see the results. Cool. Yeah, no, I, I love uh, looking at your photos. So I'll have to post that on my website as well. 
What? It works really well with plants too. But the okay. thing with photo stacking is that if the subject is moving, then you just get lots of copies of the image and your oh, final right. output image and it looks trippy but terrible. <laughs> so um photo stacked images of plants do look awesome. You just have to keep them very still. So mm, usually okay. if I'm in the field, I'll just grab a flower and throw it down either on the ground or on some black velvet. And as mm. long as the wind isn't too strong, you can photo stack um, you know, really well doing that. Um, or if there's, you know, sometimes there's flowers that are not moving, not very often, but occasionally. Hmm. Uh, um, and so, uh, but usually what I'll do is just um, take the plant and bring it inside and then just, you know, put some black velvet up, some LED lights, and then you can get really spectacular plant photos that have a black background and just incredible detail. Right. And it doesn't take very long, you know, you just grab it, bring it inside, and, you know, it just, like, takes like a, just takes a minute or less. Hmm. Wow. Have you found that there's a limitation or some sort of obstacle you have to um, work through in this field of study? Limitation or obstacle? Jeez, I mean, that could be interpreted so many different ways. <laughs> um, but certainly one, one common thing is that you sequence something and you get your sequence data back and you blast it and there's no matches in GenBank. Um, that's really common. That means usually means you found something rare, mm -hmm. and so you got to figure out what it is. Oh. And you know the microscope is really good because people have been studying fungi with microscopes for a couple hundred years. So that's how you can compare your mushroom with everything in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, another common scenario is you blast it and you get several names back, and they're not all synonyms because oh. anybody can add any sequences to GenBank under any name, and you have to figure out which one you have. Um, that's another time when the microscope um, helps a lot to, to untangle that. Okay. And uh, on the flip side, what do you think is your favorite thing about this? Or what do you get most excited about? I mean, it's really nice just to spend time outside and not be in a rush, but just, uh, you know, very slowly go through the woods and look at cool things. And uh, you know, also, there's a lot of really cool people that are into mushrooms. It's really, it's really nice hanging out with the people, um, you know, mycologists and also, you know, people that study insects or botanists, you know, and just learn about nature from other people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's probably the best thing is just going through nature with other experts and, and just kind of nerding out on it. Yes. I love networking and nerding out with people. <laughs> Uh, fun question. If you had unlimited resources, what would you want to study? Um, I'd study the same thing that I was studying now, but I'd hire a bunch more people to do it. Okay. So what I'd really like is a team of 10 people to study the mushrooms that I find. Because um, right now I spend like half my time in the field and half mm -hmm. my time in the lab. And that's good. It provides some balance, but it takes so long to study these things and I can't even really study them properly. So if I had unlimited resources, I would hire like 10 people and there would be two or three analytical chemists. So they would take each mushroom that I found, run it through LCMS. Mm -hmm. um, and if they find anything interesting there, maybe use NMR, X-ray crystallography, just figure out exactly what compounds are in the mushrooms. Uh -huh. um, one cool thing about that is that most mushrooms you can cultivate on a, on a large scale in the cool culture. So if you were... Um, if you were just uh, able to find a mushroom that had a really interesting, maybe new medicine or some kind of valuable protein, you could just throw it in a 10,000 liter bioreactor and make a whole lot of it and okay. you know, have a, a, a whole lot of this molecule. And so, you know, just being able to figure out what's in your mushrooms um, would be really cool. And also just to be able to publish like w along with the DNA sequence, a chemical analysis would be really neat. Hmm. Um, but it would also be really cool to hire some people to do taxonomy because I discover so many new species. Just, you know, I just kind of like, you know, especially in California, I kind of yeah. know what's been described uh, and what hasn't. So just like, you know, just look, look, looking around, there's so many new species and there's nobody paid to describe them. So mm. if I could pay people to do, you know, really good work, um, you know, the really high end microscopy and, um, and, you know, sequence a few different genes, maybe a, a full genome sequence, mm -hmm. um, and write a really good scientific paper, um, that put a good name on these, you know, not just name it after like a person, but name it mm -hmm. after a unique feature that they mm -hmm. have, then, um, you know, that would, be, that would be really cool. Hmm. Wow. That's really cool. Um, and somebody else had a question. If you could be any plant, which plant would you be? 
<laughs> oh, any plants. Jeez, that's a difficult question. Yes, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I like plants a lot, but I don't really have any favorite plants. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the same thing with mushrooms. I like mushrooms a lot, but I don't have a favorite mushroom. Just mm. whatever plant is right in front of me or whichever yep. mushroom is, is right in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been, I'm drawn to dangerous plants. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'll drive long distances to, to look for a nita scolis or something. Okay. Um, one time I was in Oaxaca and I grabbed the stem of a nita scolis multilobus to put, pull me up at this really steep hillside. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's one of the most, most dangerous plants out there. And it was kind of like being stung by a whole high, a uh, horde of bees all at once. <sighs> um, and so I kind of went up this hillside and, you know, my hands hurt, but also I, w I went into anaphylactic shock and oh, no. I, um, my whole body was just covered in red spots within a couple minutes. And so I had to drive back. Um, I was with a couple friends, but they didn't know how to drive. Cool. And so I drove myself back uh, about 45 minutes to the nearest city. And oh, my goodness. luckily, you know, it was getting dark by then, but we were able to like bang on the door of a doctor and get them to come out. And, you know, they saved my life for about 10 bucks. It was five wow. bucks for the epinephrine shot and five bucks for the doctor visit wow um but you know ever since then i've kind of had a, had a fondness for like extremely dangerous plants <laughs> and so um it would probably be yeah something in need of scoreless wow wow that's really cool that's a that's a crazy story as well it's like be saved uh by this deadly plant or fall off a cliff i don't know mm -hmm. um what do you see the future looking like um, with mushroom identification? Like, mm -hmm. So the DNA barcoding has helped out so much um, because before the DNA barcoding came along, um, people had to rely on just microscopes and their senses to figure out what was what and if mm -hmm. two things were the same. And that worked about half the time, but half the time is not very much of the time, really. Mm -hmm. So the really cool thing that DNA barcoding does is it tells you which collections are the same. So if you have a whole bunch of different collections, you know, for sure, which ones are the same species, which ones are different species. But, you know, most of the mushrooms have not been barcoded or not really studied very well. So I think in the future, there'll be a whole lot more DNA barcoding. And um, last night I visited Stephen Russell, who's doing more DNA barcoding than anyone else in the world. Okay. And he is... Um, Super cool guy doing really great work, but one of the things he's doing um, are these micro blitzes. And so, next, next online micro blitz that he is uh, sponsoring is going to be August 11th through the 20th. Okay. And so, people anywhere in North America, if they collect mushrooms during those dates, they can send them to Stephen Russell and he will DNA barcode all of them for free. Wow. And so, his goal is to get 100,000 mushrooms um, DNA barcoded into GenBank in the next 10 years. And um, he works really hard. He'll probably accomplish that goal. Uh, wow. I think he's got oh, some huge number from Indiana, maybe like 25,000 from Indiana. Whoa. And so by um, doing statistical analysis, he's figured out that he's going to need to like DNA barcode like 100,000 mushrooms from Indiana to really get a, get a good handle on mm -hmm. how many mushrooms there are in Indiana. Uh, he just moved in Michigan in Ann Arbor. So now he's you know, doing some doing you know Michigan stuff. And he really does all of North America. Wow. So he says that once he gets a hundred thousand mushrooms sequenced from North America, he'll be able to calculate how many more he will need to sequence to get a pretty good picture of the fungal biodiversity in North America. Oh. So that's the goal right now. And it's really um you know, like he, what he does is he sequences everything using nanopore flow cells. So mm -hmm. he runs PCR with tagged primers, and then he runs 960 PCR products on one flungal cell. So the price per sequence is very low, and he's automated a lot of it. So it just uh, goes into iNaturalist and oh. GenBank automatically, oh, wow. which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but in the future, I think, you know, well, the thing that he says is that the, the bottleneck now is really the collections. So uh, instead of, he says that people shouldn't even learn DNA sequencing anymore. What they should do now is just focus on making lots of collections. Okay. And so, you know, making a good collection requires some patience to find the good mushrooms and then take a good picture and then dry them well mm -hmm. and label them well. 
and store them well. Uh, mm. But it's totally worth it. And so he needs more people making more collections. And okay. that's, that's really how you discover stuff. So I think in the future, we're going to have more people, just individuals and more mushroom clubs making more collections and getting all those collections DNA barcoded and get the data into GenBank so it's available to the world for free forever. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and what kind of tips would you or advice would you give people getting into this to make good specimen collections or, um, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely, um, you know, it takes like maybe an average 10 minutes to, to find a mushroom and take a bad photo of it. Whereas it takes on average 11 minutes to find a mushroom and take like a really professional quality photo that could be the cover of a field guide. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really helps to, um, to pay attention to your photography. And, you know, even with the cell phone, you can get really good pictures. A lot of times when I'm out with people, um, they'll, you know, I'll we'll find some mushrooms and I'll see them taking pictures with their phone. And I'll ask if I can borrow their phone for a second. And then I will take pictures with their phone. And I'm able to, you know, the pictures that I take turn out way different than the pictures that they take. Right. And I don't do anything special. It's just all about where you hold the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, for small mushrooms, you kind of like put the phone as close as possible and then use the digital zoom to fill the screen mm. and just make sure it's focused well. Also, just a little bit of extra light can really help with a cell phone photo, as can black velvet. You know, a black background yeah. doesn't have to be with a camera. A cell phone can take amazing pictures when you have, there's a, a piece of black velvet a couple feet behind the mushroom. Right. Um, so, yeah, just like helping people get better photos is something that I do a lot. Um, I teach a lot of photography workshops as well. I think the next one will be in like September 20, 23rd okay. or so in um, like Madeline Island, Wisconsin. Uh, but I'm also help, happy to help people just like for free over the internet if they want to message me. You know, I'm happy to give free photography advice. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so what does a typical day kind of look like for you currently? Um, usually, you know, if I'm out in the field, I like to camp out because that way, you know, it's like wake up and I'm already out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, usually just, uh, spend as much of the day as I can walking around, um, trek as many different habitats as I can, uh, to look for cool mushrooms and then take really good pictures of them. Um, and it takes me just about the same amount of time it takes me to find and photograph the mushrooms, to process the data on the computer, get them all uploaded to Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought in the woods for four hours, um, then I'm on the computer for four hours. And of course, that never happens. So the photos just stack up and there's tons of photos that I'll never get online. And that's totally OK. Mm -hmm. um, but once I get all of the photos processed, then I just make sure all of the mushrooms are really well labeled and dried with an iNaturalist observation number um, and separated so they're not going to mix when my car hits a bump or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, yeah, PCR when I can, usually an hour or two in the evening, identifying stuff for people on iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer um, and some time on social media to kind of share my passion with what I've been finding and try to inspire other people to, to get into this stuff. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. That seems like a fun packed day. <laughs> yeah. Day. That's, that's so, usually how it is. Awesome. And I, I like that. Um, this is more fulfilling than your previous job. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually have two um, questions that I ask all my guests. So how does flora and fungi as a whole influence the future? How do flora and fungi as a whole influence the future? Mm -hmm. um, that's a difficult question. And, <laughs> um, you know, without flora and fungi, we, we would all die. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking yeah. for. Any answer is correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then how can more people get involved with flora and funga? Yeah, um, you will try to get people to do is just go out and take pictures of mushrooms and put them on iNaturalist. And that's really the best way to connect people to, um, you know, other people who like mushrooms and, you know, just like, you know, figure out what they have. It kind of keeps a list of everything that they've been finding. 
Um, you know, but really it's best to save everything you photograph. So if you can like take pictures of mushrooms, um, especially get the underside, because a lot of mushrooms look good, like the same from the top, mm -hmm. and then save dried collections labeled with the iNaturalist observation number. Even if you don't have the, a way to sequence them today, um, you know, there's more and more mushroom clubs and uh, are coming online with sequencing. The sequencing is getting easier and less expensive with every day that passes. And for every sequence that's in GenBank, all of the other sequences become more useful. So you can make a big contribution um, just finding mushrooms and saving them. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can talk to Stephen Russell about getting them sequenced, maybe, um, maybe participate in the microblitz. Mm -hmm. um, or just get a PCR machine and sequence them yourself. It's really not that hard. Cool. Um, I always tell people like sequencing, setting up a little DNA sequencing lab in your house and using it. It's more difficult than cooking eggs, but it's easier than baking bread. Huh. So it's wow. um, it, it's really not that hard at all. And you can also yeah. discover tons of new species of plants right. you know, the same way. Um, but really, any any organism that catches your interest. Cool. Well, thank you, Alan, for being on the podcast today. I love chatting with you, and I'm really excited to actually meet you in person at uh, Southwest Funga Fest. Really nice talking to you. Yes, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, let listeners know how people can find you or um, any resources you'd like to plug. Let's see. Um, Instagram is a good way to find me. It's just Alan underscore Rockefeller on mm -hmm. Instagram. Um, and I'll be, you know, lots of different. Uh, you know, fungus festivals and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the most important thing you can do is just go out and really study the mushrooms that you see. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, once you find them and put them in iNaturalist, there's lots of ways to get more connected. Um, but that's the main thing I try to impress on people is that these mushrooms are almost everywhere and they're really cool and they're definitely worth taking a closer look at. Yes, they are. Thank you again. Thank you. See ya. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please listen to how Energy Bits can help you. Do you want something that will help you improve your overall health, nutrition, longevity, and vitality? It could be as simple as not being hangry anymore. I have a solution for you. So, I have Energy Bits, which are an algae supplement. It's a whole food, one ingredient, no sugar, no caffeine tons of protein and vitamins. So, I work with this company called Energy Bits and they send me algae tablets. It's a superfood, super good, super easy to digest. I always run into this issue. I am a little hungry, but I don't wanna eat a full meal, especially when I'm about to get on interviews I want to have a clear mind. I don't want to be too full. I go to Energy Bits because it's a good snack, good whole food. Also easy to just add, just have a handful. You can have two tablets, you could have uh, 20 tablets. So let me explain what Energy Bits is. Energy Bits is a combination of either chlorella or spirulina or both. So they have, I think, four different types. We got Energy Bits, which is the spirulina type, which is what I use in the morning for that daily boost, high in nutrients, protein, helps with mitochondria. So that is something that you usually consume in the morning with smoothie, smoothies and things like that. But also, Chlorella. Chlorella is for helping with detox, uh, getting rid of different toxins, different toxins, restore your alkaline pH. It is good 
for uh, heart, bone, and skin health. I like using a combination of them just because it's easier, uh, but I've also used the spirulina more in the morning. I've used the chlorella at night, so I actually have this. <laughs> I have this in a little jar right next to my bed, which I take my probiotic and then just like a little handful of these. My mom also, she likes to eat a lot of these. So if she's having, um, you know, a fun Friday night where she has to do a six to 10 mile run the next morning, which is crazy. Uh, she just takes a big handful of these. So sometimes I see her walking around the corner and she's got like a green mouth. So like these actually, you know, make your, make your mouth all green. But there's different ways to actually consume this as well. So you can either chew it like I'm doing, which is actually good for some of your teeth health as well. So the algae can get in and actually clean your teeth. You can just take it with water or you could blend it up in smoothies, which is also, so I kind of do a combination of all three of them. But I like having, you know, a grab and go mobile, clean, healthy snack. And that's why I like Energy Bits so much is you can just have a handful. Actually one tablet is considered a whole a plate of vegetables, so that's how much nutrients it has in there, just so um, you don't get hangry. So I know there's some people out there and I know there's some partners out there that's like, yeah, my partner is always hangry. Um, so yeah, there's a solution for that. Just take a little handful of energy bits and you are good to go. Uh, good to tide you over for your next meal. If you want to try um, energy bits at all, vitality bits, beauty bits, or recovery bits, those are the different four bits, bites that they have. Go to energybits.com and use the code FLORAFUNGA for 20% off. So that link will be down below or somewhere for you to click away and get your 20% uh, off order of energy bits. Also, if you want to learn more about energy bits and the health benefits and all of the uh, down and nerdy details, go watch the episode with me and with Catherine. Okay, so thank you.